the orthopedics of surgeons up at Northeast. Um, like I said, his focus is upper extremities, shoulder and elbows. Today he's going to speak on the ulnar collateral ligament, Dr. Kusick. All right. Is this working? So you guys can uh, stop me and ask questions if you want to. I'm going to kind of – so I'm going to talk about ulnar collateral ligament injuries of the elbow or, you know, Tommy John procedures and Tommy John surgeries that we uh, hear about. Um, so I have to give a, uh, a thanks to the, the – the information I'm presenting here is from the Andrews Sports Medicine Institute. I had some friends that uh, worked with Dr. Andrews, and uh, they, did, they have the most comprehensive body of work on, on this particular topic. So, so I'm going to present a study that uh, the largest number of patient studies uh, and the longest follow-up, which was done at the Andrews Sports Medicine Institute for ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction. So the purpose would just break down the study and talk about it. So the purpose of the study was to continue the evaluation of the UCL reconstructions in athletes at all skill levels. Um, so just briefly, what we're talking about, the ulnar collateral ligament complex is the medial ligament complex to the elbow. It's made up of three discrete ligaments, the, tr uh, the transverse bundle, which imparts virtually no stability to the elbow, the posterior bundle, which has a, st a role in stability, but the primary structure we're speaking of is the anterior bundle of the ulnar collateral ligament. And it's the main medial stabilizer of the elbow, particularly in overhead throwing sports. So there are other uh, factors that contribute to elbow stability. Uh, there's, there's passive or bony restraints that contribute to elbow stability, such as the, the, uh, the fit of the olecranon into the fossa on the back of the distal humerus. Uh, the radiocapitellar joint or the lateral joint side of the of the elbow joint and then there's active muscular uh, groups the flexor pronator mass the ankyneus and the extensor mass so to talk about ulnar collateral ligament injuries you have to think about this entity known as valgus extension overload which is kind of depicted in this picture so you can imagine with an overhead throwing athlete at a high velocity that there's a medial <clears throat> stress on the elbow a tensile or stretch and, and a resultant lateral compression on the elbow with that force as they accelerate through their, through their pitch. And then at the end, in that, in that position of tension on the medial side and compression on the lateral side, you're forced into rapid extension. Um, and so these people do this. So, so you can get uh, bony changes from doing that over and over and over again. And people refer to that as this posteromedial osteophyte. So a little bone spur that develops because, because of the incongruity of the elbow joint that progresses eventually to some loose bodies, and you guys may have seen some pitchers or athletes that have, that have had those types of issues. So briefly, just to understand again, there's a study, a pretty good study on the anatomy and dimensions of the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament that was done. It looked at 13 cadavers uh, that had uh, no evidence of prior elbow surgery. And so these are just some pictures of the dissections. Of the, of the medial side of the elbow and the computer that was used to generate these, these images. And so these are some close-up pictures. This one's a little bit blurry. Can you guys see that? Um, and, and, and what they tried to do was attempt to quantify the, the, uh, the dimensions of the UCL more accurately. So they have it dissected here, the proximal origin on the medial epicondyle, and this is the ulna attachment uh, on the sublime tubercle of the ulna. And so they, they measured the width in three different locations. Uh, proximal, medial, and distal, and they notice that as you progress distally towards the ulna, the, uh, the width gets, uh, gets larger. The other thing that they notice that's important for imaging, and we'll talk about that later, is that pretty uniform uh, origin on the medial epicondyle, but that the insertion was broad, and it oftentimes was not exactly at the, uh, at the articular cartilage of the joint line. It actually was uh, found to be a little bit distal in most of the specimens. So they gave us some average numbers so that we understand that this thing gets broader as it inserts on the ulna. They also, again, noticed that, that, again, in most of the specimens, let me just show you this, in most of the specimens there is, let's see if this works, in 11 of the 13 specimens, the uh, insertion onto the ulna was not directly at the articular cartilage margin, but a little bit distal. Um, which is important, like I said, when we talk about imaging and how to determine whether there's a true injury to this ligament. <clears throat> so this is just showing about two or three millimeters uh, on the left in those 11 specimens and then right on the articular cartilage joint line there. So how can the, how can the uh, ligament be injured? 
You can have a partial injury or a complete injury to the ligament. These are just depicting deplete injuries uh, or complete injuries, one right off of the uh, origin at the distal humerus, one intra-substance, and one at, the, uh, at its insertion. So how, does, how do these people present? They're typically, the vast majority of them are overhead throwing athletes, pitchers, um, and, uh, and some of them, about 50% of them will probably present with acute onset medial elbow pain that began after a pitch, after a throw, they heard a pop. But then the other portion of these patients, about another 50%, won't really have any landmark injury. They'll just have com vague complaints of medial elbow pain uh, and fatigue. Uh, they might have a history of uh, steroid injections, but we don't routinely use those in our practice. Uh, so how do you determine it on physical exam? There's a couple of exam maneuvers. So one is direct palpation. Once you understand the anatomy of its origin and insertion, direct palpation over the medial uh, ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow. With a, with a, and then there's two valgus stress, so a, a milking maneuver. The, the uh, elbow is abducted into 90 degrees uh, at, and externally rotated. You supinate the forearm and, and pull on the, on the extended thumb. So you're applying a valgus stress to the elbow in that position while you're palpating there. People will feel some instability, some pain, or both with that. It's called a milking maneuver. Uh, and then there's a valgus stability test uh, or a rotary, valgus rotary stability test. You can do this prone. Some people think that eliminates some of the other variables. I do this you know, seated or with the arm rested on the exam table. And basically, again, you're, you're, you're applying a consistent valgus stress across the elbow as you rotate or shear their elbow from about 30 to 140 degrees. And pain through that arc heightens your suspicion of an injury to the ulnar collateral ligament. So what do you do if you have to reconstruct these? We'll talk about options, but the, the main graft used is, a, is an autograft from the ipsilateral side, and it's the palmaris longus tendon, which is a small tendon. If you pinch your thumb and forefinger together, about 70 to 80% of people have that. You can clearly identify that tendon, and you can use that as a, a graft choice to reconstruct the ligament. So. A lot of folks that you see, especially if you see high school athletes or, or below that, if you have a partial, if you either have just vague medial uh, elbow pain or you have a, even a partial injury, partial thickness injury, these don't need to be operatively, operatively treated. You can uh, pull them out depending on the severity of their symptoms and like any other overuse injury with, uh, with rest and then progression through a rehab program of, uh, of, of interval and an interval throwing program, they can, a lot of these patients can get back to their previous level. So this, this goes back to the anatomy that we talked about, these partial tears. They, they describe a T sign. So, so you, when, we, when we put a needle in the, in the elbow joint and we put dye in there, radio-opaque dye in an arthrogram, we look to see if there's extravasation of that dye into the soft tissues. The, the, uh, the ulnar collateral ligament should stop all that extravasation. It should stay well, uh, well inside of the joint surface. But you may see some intermittent thing where you see, and I'll show you some pictures, a T sign which might indicate that you have a partial undersurface injury to the ligament, but not a complete injury. So these are examples of the T-sign. So this is the medial side of the elbow. And on this side, see this dye in here is normal in the elbow joint. And, and this dye coming up here uh, is abnormal, but it's not, it's not coming way out here in, in large volume. So, so this is probably a partial thickness undersurface origin of the MUCL injury. And then this is the same thing shown distally, right? So normal dye here, and then you come down here and, and you see some extravasation of that dye. But again, it's not, it's not ballooning out into the soft tissues. If you see that type of picture, then you have a complete rupture. Uh, so this is the T sign that, that you see on arthrograms. These are just some arthroscopic photos from Andrew's group showing what you might, if you're looking in the medial gutter, the elbow, that you can see this uh, undersurface injury to the, to the ulnar collateral ligament complex. So the other way you can, uh, another diagnostic entity, you know, MR arthrogram, if I'm seriously suspecting a, a, a partial or complete MUCL injury, I'm going to use an MR arthrogram to, to, to look at, to evaluate that. But in some places, we don't use this in, in our clinic because we just don't have the capability. You can use a stress plane x-ray uh, to evaluate the UCL. Uh, so this is the rig that, that, that's used that provides a static valgus stress across the elbow and you can imagine with that stress placed on the elbow you might see a, a widening uh, here on the medial side of the elbow with with a see this is maybe a normal size space and this is a enlarged space they say that about one millimeter if you do this routinely about one millimeter of difference between those two x-rays should raise your suspicion for a for a medial ulnar collateral ligament injury and they were pretty accurate with this uh, so 
they, they look at a lot of these arthroscopically. Again, I don't do this, and, and this is the appearance of a more normal MUCL with the ulna tightly opposed to the distal humerus, and this is that gap that you might see if you have some instability with incompetence of that ligament. Uh, this is, again, just an arthroscopic photo of what we just saw on the last page, a relatively normal, and then this, this, uh, this valgus instability here. So what do you do if you do go on to reconstruction, if you have a full tear? There's a study done uh, by Dr. Savoy, who's another uh, upper extremity surgeon that looked at uh, repair of these ligaments, so primary repair, just suturing the ends of the, of the ligament together. He got pretty good results, but most people, and the sports guys in the room can tell me if they think any different. Most people reconstruct this ligament because the results with reconstruction, so, so putting in a new piece of tendon and a graft are so much better or have been so much better than, uh, than primary repair. So there's three ways to repair it, and we won't get into all the details, but this is the old modified Job method, which is, you know, Job is the famous surgeon that first did the Tommy John procedure through bone tunnels on both the humerus and the ulna. And then there's been some modifications by other surgeons to, to either include a bone bridge or, or suture anchors in order to have less complications with pull out of the bone tunnels or some sort of bony injury after the repair. This is another picture of the modified Job technique. So again, we're not going to go into too much detail on the, the surgical technique here. Um, but it's a curvilinear incision that's based over the medial epicondyle. It's probably about six centimeters in each direction. You know, the ulnar nerve lies directly posterior in the cubital tunnel right near here, so you have to mobilize that nerve, uh, get it out of the way. Some people will transpose that nerve and never put it back where it came from, and other people don't think that's necessary. The Andrews group always transposes their nerve. So this study, which is what I was, uh, wanted to present to you guys, the largest study in the literature with uh, 1,289 UCL reconstructions, that's by far the largest study available, with a minimum of two-year follow-up with almost 950 patients. So that's a pretty impressive series. So 926 males, average age of 21. 94 percent of these are baseball players, overhead throwing athletes, with some, some contribution from other sports. Uh, again, particular to Andrew's cohort, because you guys all know him and know the He's very popular with the athletes. So 34% of these were major league professional baseball players, which is an incredible number. 65 major league pitchers and 255 minor league pitchers. 413 college athletes and 155 high school. So about almost all these patients reported pain in early, late cocking or early acceleration of their, of their high velocity overhead throwing. Again, we, I talked about this, about half of them saw a sudden onset of symptoms at a particular pitch and had to go out of a game, felt like they couldn't pitch and had s significant pain. The other half couldn't recall a, a particular injury per se, but they had fatigue, they couldn't keep up their velocity, and they would, they would cramp by the end of a game. Uh, just back to that, that osteophyte that, or bone spur that may form with this kind of valgus extension overload, they noticed that about 40% of these elbows had medial, medial laxity and therefore and, and valgus stress x-rays, and therefore they had uh, post-remedial osteophytes. So about a quarter of them had ulnar nerve symptoms, so you can ask your patients if they're having numbness and tingling in their fingers, because that is common in this, in this problem. Uh, this is more for the science, it's not that important. So about 7% had prior excision of post-remedial uh, olecranon osteophytes. So, 70% of them use that tendon graft that we talked about, ipsilateral palmaris graft from your forearm. And then the rest, if you don't have a palmaris, if you fall in that groove, you can use a hamstring tendon uh, to substitute for this. Uh, in this group, again, Andrews always transposes or moves the ulnar nerve into a new position so that they don't have ulnar nerve symptoms. And 30% had excision of that extra bone. So two-year follow-up. Um, so final results, the quick and dirty is that 84% of these reconstructions uh, were able to return to the same level of, of competition or higher, as opposed to the repairs that were done by some other groups where about 70% of those primary repairs were able to. So based on that information, the Andrews group, and I think most, like I said, I, we can talk to our other sports surgeons, but I think most orthopedic upper extremity surgeons prefer, prefer a reconstruction over a primary repair because of the significant, uh, significantly better outcomes in that group. So things to keep in mind if, if you have a, a thrower that does have this type of procedure. So it takes about f at least four months to return to throwing. And, and, and even in these high-level athletes with obviously full-time training, therapy, everything, we're talking about a year for professional athletes to get back before they get back to search. So I think an important thing to tell 
I think there's a misconception for our athletes that, you know, if I have medial uh, elbow pain, that maybe I can get stronger by having surgery or I can. And that's definitely not not the message that after looking at a huge uh, study of these patients, that's not the message that we need to try to get rid of that idea in our in our young throwing athletes. So again, 89% of major league baseball players were, were able to return to the pr professional level, but only about 70% back to their major league pre-operative status. And there's a 10% complication rate mo with, with a large number of these procedures. Most of the complications were like transient numbness and tingling and neuropraxias that resolved, but, but there is a, a steady complication rate uh, with the procedure. So general conclusions, uh, medial ulnar collateral ligament reconstruction, uh, yields a more favorable result than primary repair. And I think that's pretty well documented now in our literature. Uh, and that you can expect, I mean, this is a reliable procedure if done correctly. You can expect good or excellent results regardless of the, the skill level. It is interesting to note that if you subdivide the uh, cohorts of patients by their level, so the high school athletes uh, did worse overall in that group than the higher level athletes. And that probably, we can, we can, talk about why that might be, but it's likely because, you know, if you're throwing mechanics or putting you in a situation where you are already having medial ulnar collateral ligament injury at the high school level, then you're, you're, it's unlikely that you need to have significant changes in your technique and your core strength, et cetera, and we can talk about that a little bit more, or you're unlikely to progress to a higher level of play. <clears throat> so 10% complication rate and a return to sport requires approximately one year. So that's a good expectation to set for a kid if you're treating them or dealing with them, that this is not a, a quick fix. Um, and so how do we prevent it, which I, probably a lot of people in this room may, uh, would be interested in. So, you know, you, I'm sure you guys have seen this type of thing before, but this is an overuse injury, you know. So we're talking about there's well-established pitches per game, pitches per week and per season and year for all the different age groups. And I'm sure you guys have seen this or have this in your office, et cetera. But but these are things that are uh, that are critical. You know, uh, same thing with uh, days of rest in between pitching is important. You know, I tell the kids that come into my office that have these kind of symptoms that, of course, there are exceptions to the rule. But the vast majority of major league baseball pitchers don't come from states like Florida, Texas, where you can play all year round um, because the, those kids wear out their arms. They come from up north where they have to take a forced weather induced three month break from sport every year. And so I, I usually try to frighten them a little bit and get them to realize how important a break can be for them for their overall longevity in the sport. So, and then the other thing is of course, uh, the, the critical thing. So, so about breaking pitches, I bet everyone's heard about curveball and sliders and that you don't want to start that at a certain age. I don't know that that's been backed up with more recent literature. Uh, I think it's more an overall pitch count issue uh, than it is Per, you know, if they have a great slider or a great curveball, I, I, I'm not so particular about that when I counsel kids. Um, so, but the critical thing is that, you know, all these kids in high school that are having these problems, and you guys have probably heard this a million times, the pitch starts from your legs, it starts from your feet, it starts from your core, and all these kids have poor, have weak cores, I mean, all of them. And, and so they're, they're hurling this ball as hard as they can, they're not keeping good form and they're not starting their, their entire, so, so they really need to, that's the emphasis, strengthening from the ground up because they're just not in the shape to, to continue to perform at that level. Um, so those are the general uh, thoughts on UCL reconstruction. Thanks. Questions? Can't say anything. No? Thank you very much. Yeah.
Okay, our next presenter, uh, we know him from yesterday, uh, is Brett Singer. He's going to talk to us again on nutrition, uh, pre- and post-game nutrition. So this should be interesting because I came from the old school. It didn't matter what you ate. You could eat anything you wanted and be a, you know, perform. So, and the old school was, you know, you could name different people who had gold medals and stuff, and they ate pizza and things like that. So I'm sure that he's changed that perception a little bit. Okay, how are y'all? Thanks for having me back again, one more day. All right, so my name is Brett, I am a dietitian. I talked to you all yesterday, so we're talking about pre uh, and post game nutrition, affordable pre and post game nutrition meals. I'm not giving a cooking demonstration or anything like that, but I can give you some tips and some ideas, so that's what we're gonna work on today. Um, so today we're gonna talk about um, the, what happens during a game some of the goals of pre-game and post-game nutrition, uh, what we need to be consuming, what we need to be avoiding, the timing of the meals, as well as post-game nutrition and recovery. So I wanna start off with going over what actually occurs during exercise from a nutrition point of view. I think in order to know how we should be eating, we need to know what's happening from nutrition during the exercise itself. So during exercise, once we start high exercise activity, like most of your athletes during a game, once that occurs, blood flow is shunted away from the digestive tract going toward the muscle. So that means gastric emptying or the rate that food passes through your stomach slows down dramatically. Okay. During exercise, we utilize carbohydrates in the form of blood glucose, in the form of muscle glycogen, and in the form of fat we use those for energy. As the intensity of exercise goes up, we start to rely more and more on carbohydrates. So for most team sport activities, majority of the time, as the, inten as the intensity goes up, like most of those sports will, the carbohydrates are gonna be what we focus on most for energy utilization. Okay. As glycogen or as our storage of carbohydrates goes down, as our blood glu glucose goes down, fatigue starts to set in. And then lastly, we start to see, obviously we sweat, we lose fluid and electrolytes. Okay, so we need to know what's occurring during exercise to know how we should approach it. Now we're skipping all over the place. Okay, so with that in mind, one of the first goals is that we want to eat in a way that allows ourselves to fully digest the meal prior to the start of exercise. So if gastric emptying slows down dramatically once exercise begins, we want to make sure all that food is digested before exercise begins. That way that doesn't become an issue. We want to feel comfortably full. We don't want to feel stuffed. We don't want to feel like we're going to throw up. And we don't want to feel weak or starving either. So we want to find that balance. We know that as glycogen gets depleted, we start to feel fatigued. So we should eat in a way where we're consuming carbohydrates to maximize our glycogen levels, which gives us the ability to exercise longer before we hit that wall. Okay, and then obviously we wanna start the exercise off hydrated. Okay, so with timing in mind, my recommendation for any athlete is going to be that we try and have a pregame meal one to four hours in advance. I think it's crucial that they realize that as we change the time frame, our meals should change as well. You should not be having the same meal four hours in advance that you would have one hour in advance. If you do that, you're often going to find that you're going to have major issues from a stomach discom discomfort point of view. Okay. We want to make sure that as the game approaches that the portion sizes decrease and that we really start to cut down on what we are providing in our meals. So the closer to game time, the more we want to focus on carbohydrates and the less we want to focus on those alternative energy sources. So what should we be consuming? We need to be consuming easily digestible carbohydrates. Small portions of lean protein. We don't need to be having giant steaks or anything like that. And we need to be consuming fluids. For carbohydrates, 
the main focal point of the game or pregame meal. When we consume carbohydrates, I think it's important to note that we store carbohydrates in the form of muscle glycogen, liver glycogen, and we have blood glucose. We use muscle glycogen and blood glucose for energy during exercise. Liver glycogen is utilized to maintain our blood sugar at normal level. So we don't use liver glycogen during exercise. That's used to keep our blood sugar in check. Okay, now, when we go to sleep, much of our liquor, liver glycogen is actually depleted overnight. So we can lose as much as about 50% of our liver glycogen as we sleep. So this means the following morning, if an athlete gets up for a game, the liver glycogen that's utilized to maintain their blood sugar at a normal level is now depleted. They are more likely to potentially get hypoglycemic. So we know that they should be having something for a pregame meal, whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon. After a fasted state for morning games, we've seen different studies showing that you can increase muscle glycogen by about 11 to 15 percent and liver glycogen by as much as about 30 to 40%. Okay, so that's a significant increase in glycogen. That's a significant increase in energy that we have available for games. So we know we need to be having carbohydrates prior to game time, especially if it's an early morning session. Additionally, we know that as glycogen lowers, we get fatigued. We've seen several different studies where they have athletes participate either in a glycogen depleted state or in full glycogen state. And we see that skill levels, energy levels, are dr dramatically different between the two. So in those who are well-fueled at the end of the game or at the end of a training session during studies, they can show that they can shoot more accurately, that they can pass, that they can dribble, that they can do all the skills necessary to perform at their best significantly better than those who are at a glycogen depleted state. So we know we want to start off our exercise or our game with a full level of glycogen. That allows us to go longer into the game before we feel fatigued and allows us to perform better at a higher skill level for longer in the game. Okay, I think this is a helpful, this is from a website called My Sports Science. I think it's a very helpful website for all of you. Um, it's a, a researcher in nutrition. He provides all sorts of different just uh, blogs or topics on different research studies that are coming out. He provides all sorts of different infographics. I think it's a helpful tool. This is one that I found really helpful. It's basically showing different heart rates. And what it's showing here is that the left-hand side over here, we're seeing that during that time it's a lower heart rate. So 50% heart rate max, 60% heart rate max. We're utilizing a good amount of fat during that time. But as the heart rate goes up, as we start to approach 80, 85% of our heart rate max, we are no longer utilizing hardly any fat or any fat at all. We are only utilizing carbohydrates. Now, I understand there's some sports activities where we don't get our heart rate up that high all the time, but there's some sports like basketball or like football or like soccer or tennis or whatever it may be where our heart rate is up very, very high. And therefore, it's just showing us that carbohydrates are a major, major part of uh, our energy utilization. Okay, so carbohydrate options, I know you know this already, but it's things like grains, rice, pasta. Uh, it's going to be things like fruits, starchy vegetables, dairy can work, add-ons like jellies, honeys, jams, sports drinks. I also think it's helpful to note that the closer you get to game time, typically the more refined we want to be with our carbohydrates, meaning that whole grain bread, while great day-to-day, -day, is not always the best choice right before a game. Whole grain bread is broken down much more slowly. It may sit in the stomach longer. It may lead to stomach discomfort. So if you have an athlete who always complains of feeling uncomfortable because the breakfast they have sits too heavy, so now they decide they're not going to eat anything, the transition might not be from whole grain bagel or whole grain toast to nothing. The transition should be from whole grain bread to white bread or a white bagel. Perhaps this is digested quicker and it sits a little easier on their stomach. So the closer to exercise, typically the more refined I go. I'll go from whole grain brown rice to white rice as we get closer, or from whole grain bread to white bread as we get closer. Um, these are some different carbohydrate sources. So we talk about affordable meals. Uh, I'll get into a few different meal examples in a little bit. This is in your packet, but it's different options. All these are about 30 grams of carbohydrates. So we've got apples, bagels, bananas, bread. All of these items 
are 65 cents or lower. Rice, bread, pasta, we're talking 20 cents or lower. I don't care if your athlete is low economic status, upper class, it doesn't matter. I would not be telling them any differently on what they should be having pre or post game. The price does not matter. Rice, pasta, bread, those were the things that I would tell them to eat. And actually, those are the things that are cheapest for them to eat. So anyone can be having a good quality pregame meal. This is not me searching for cheapest items. This is me just going to HEB and finding the prices I find in 10 minutes. These are all very, very cheap sources of carbohydrates. And you'll see in a little bit, it's a good quantity of carbohydrates as well. Okay, protein. So it provides a feeling of fullness. I don't think it's an absolute necessity before a game, but I think it can be helpful. If your athlete complains of feeling constantly hungry during games, this would be something that they can have. If they're having their final pregame meal far in advance, so three or four hours in advance, this would be a good item to have. And make sure that they feel comfortably full by the time the game time rolls around. We want to make sure if we are having uh, meat or protein that it, it's a lean form. So we're not having ribs and we're not having steak. We're having baked or grilled chicken or fish or shrimp or something like that, something very lean. Okay, again, a little bit less options that I've got listed here, but these are some protein options. They're not in your binder, unfortunately, but these are still cheap prices. So what we're seeing, chicken, deli meat, milk, yogurt, these are all less than a dollar per portion. Each of these is about 15 to 20 grams of approximately in protein. So if you're having a meal four hours in advance or two hours in advance or one hour in advance, these are all somewhat appropriate options that you can have that they should be able to tolerate easily that are all very, very cheap. Okay, what we should be avoiding, high fat foods, okay, high greasy foods or foods that are especially greasy, foods that are too large in portions or foods that are too fibrous. Um, I think sometimes people have meals beforehand, they have one bad experience with it and they go to nothing at all from there on out and I think that's a problem. I've had, last week we had a client who ran a 10K and they had a merit, or before their 10K, they had a bagel with a load of peanut butter, and it was a whole grain bagel. And they threw up afterwards, and they felt terrible. Now he's running marathons. Guess, guess what he has before marathons? Nothing. 26.2 miles, he has nothing beforehand because of one terrible experience. Now we started talking about, well, high fat's not a good idea. Your whole grain bagel was really high in fiber, so that's probably not the best idea. So we went ahead and swapped it out. We went with a white bagel. We went with no peanut butter at all, okay? And that was easy enough to tolerate. Now they're having a much better experience with it. So look at for those foods that are especially things that we should avoid, like that high fat foods, the high greasy foods, high fiber foods. Okay, meal timing. Um, so this is just to give you an idea. Again, I did the calculation with y'all yesterday. So if you want to, for practical purposes, you can determine someone's carbohydrate needs uh, with this. And so you can divide the weight into kilograms and that'll help you out with it. Okay, so three to four hours in advance. Now we're, we have plenty of time to let food digest so we can be a little bit more lenient with what we consume. In this case, what I would say is what the textbook will recommend is three to four grams per kilogram, meaning that a 50 kilogram athlete could have as much as 150 to 200 grams of carbohydrates. In my personal opinion, and in most dietitians' opinions from my, my experience, this is way, way, way too much. But it is the textbook recommendation, so I want to put it out there for you. I typically believe one to two is grams per kilogram is totally enough. Uh, if you look at this from a, a more practical point of view, if you've got a 200 pound, 220 pound football player, that means he would need to be eating 300 to 400 grams of carbohydrates before a game. Probably not realistic in most cases. So for a triathlon, an elite marathon, something like that, I think this is a potential option. But in this particular case, I don't think it's the best option. Okay. Lean protein, we want to be taking in about 15 to 20 grams of protein for this, and that's just to make sure that we feel full. And we want to make sure that we limit our fat and veggies, but we can have at least a little bit of it. Okay, so what we're looking for, choose grains, one or two servings of fruit, two to four ounces of lean meat, and in some cases, you can add a little bit of fat, so some oil, you can add a little bit of vegetables, but they're not a necessity, they're not gonna enhance performance one way or the other. 
That's only for comfort or for taste if they want to. Okay, so the example of this that I would give. Uh, two cups of pasta with one or two teaspoons of oil, garlic toast, large apple, three ounces of grilled meat, steamed broccoli. This meal itself costs $2. 150 grams of carbohydrates, a little over $2. I don't care who you are, that's not hard to make and that's not hard to afford. $2 for that meal. If you go back and look at the prices, it's listed in examples in the, in the previous examples on the, the previous slides. I don't know why this clicker is not working. Kale, you find us. There we go. All right. So another example: a Subway sandwich. They can be either a sandwich that they make at home or a Subway sandwich that they get from a restaurant. But again, this is going to be a similar quantity of carbohydrates. It's going to be a little bit more expensive if you're actually going to a restaurant chain, but still affordable, still cheap enough for them to have. A sandwich with little cheese or no cheese, fruit, applesauce, and a sports drink. Still about 150 grams of carbohydrates or so. Perfect. All right, one to two hours before. Now we tighten it up. So now the carbohydrate amount decreases. Now we start to really pick and choose if we want to go ahead and avoid meat altogether, if we want to avoid fat altogether and avoid veggies. My recommendation is a little bit less carbohydrates, a little bit smaller portion of meat, and really go ahead and limit or cut out fat and veggies altogether in this scenario. Okay. My recommendation here would be about one to two grams per kilogram of carbohydrate. So that 50 kilogram athlete we talked about earlier, now we're taking in roughly 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrates. To me, this is an appropriate amount whether you're eating one to two hours in advance or three or four hours in advance. I think one to two grams per kilogram is a appropriate range for most athletes. Okay, so again, an example, what we're trying to do, we're just choosing grains of some sort fruit, and then in some scenarios, two to three ounces of lean meat, or a little bit of nut butter, or a little bit of dairy. Either of those can work, but we're just looking for a very small portion just to feel comfortably full. We want to really limit that fat and fiber. Okay, examples of this. So now we're looking at one cup cooked white rice, two to three ounces of meat, a banana with water. And that's going to be roughly about 75 grams of carbohydrates and it costs about one dollar. One dollar for that meal. Less than an hour. Once we're less than an hour, now we really want to tighten it up completely. Now we avoid any and all fat. We avoid protein altogether. We really try and limit fiber. And now we want a very, very small portion of carbohydrates. So now we're looking for 15 to 30 grams of carbohydrates in total. No more than that. So in this scenario, what I'm looking for is one slice of white bread with some jelly, one small piece of fruit, a little bit of sports drink. If they like those shot blocks or those gels, that can be a perfectly good option. But what we're looking for is just simple, easily digestible carbohydrates, 15 to 30 grams or so. If, and that would be in the scenario where they're having either one last snack before the game or if they're waking up you know, really early for a very early morning race, very early game. They don't have time to have something really large at that point. This would be a scenario that at least they could have this to provide some extra fuel. Okay, recovery. <laughs> All right, post-game recovery. So the first question I want to ask or that you want to be asking is when is the next game or what are they recovering for? If they've got a game within 24 hours, now we should probably be having something pretty soon after. The goal is to have something within 30 to 60 minutes for recovery. If they don't have a game, let's say it's a Friday night high school game and their next game is not until Tuesday, do they really need to be having something immediately afterwards? No, not really. They've got plenty of time to recover. Okay? You as a practitioner can know that. You understand that and you may realize that, okay, if they've got a game tonight at Friday night, and they aren't going to be home for another hour or so, it's not a big deal. It's okay for them to wait until they get home to have dinner, have a post-game meal. Okay? But from a practical standpoint, when we're talking to athletes, it's difficult to sometimes try and differentiate between time frames of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So me as a practitioner, I will typically tell my athletes that it's best to just have something regardless within 30 to 60 minutes. 
It's the easiest recommendation to make. It's an appropriate recommendation. It's not going to harm them to have something. From your point of view, if you're trying to decide between having something or not having something as a team, you know, just understand what are what is it that you're actually recovering for. If you've got plenty of time, then you don't necessarily need to be having something immediately following. Um, the second question I ask is, is how much access till they actually, or how much time till they actually have access to food? How much time till they feel comfortable eating? Um, sometimes that dictates what we need to do. You know, if they're going to not be home for two or three hours for whatever reason, if they've got to watch varsity play, and then they've got to drive home another hour, uh, now they may want to have something, you know, on site for a quick recovery option. But if they've got plenty of time, then, uh, or if they've got, you know, a quick period of time before they get home, then it, they don't need to worry so much about it. If there's a comfort level with it, maybe they don't want to have something too large. This is where a liquid recovery options sometimes a little bit easier to tolerate. Okay, so my three is R's of recovery. So some of you have heard me present before, I'm sure, um, at this conference or other times. And in this scenario, three R's of recovery is a big thing that I pretty much mention every time. So three R's of recovery are rehydrate with fluid and electrolytes, replenish our glycogen with carbohydrates, and repair with protein. So when, with rehydration, the goal is really that we just make sure that we're replacing the fluid that we've lost. So for every pound of fluid that we lose, that's equal to about 16 ounces. The goal is now to take in about 20 to 24 ounces of fluid for every pound of, of sweat loss that we have. That makes sure that we not only replace the fluid, but we replace the additional fluid that we'll lose from additional sweat and additional urination. Okay, so 20 to 24 ounces for every pound of fluid that we lose. So rehydration tips that I want you to keep in mind, chugging water right after a game is not going to help. That's just going to delay the process. So they don't want to be drinking all that water at one time. They want to be drinking in incremental amounts, small portions every 10 to 20 minutes. If it's at all possible to have fluid in the form of milk or a recovery drink or fluid with food, that will help slow down the absorption. The slower the absorption becomes, the better the retention becomes. So drinking plain water will lead to urination much quicker. If I can drink milk, which has protein, which has fat, which has carbohydrates, which has electrolytes, that slows down absorption and that improves retention. Okay, so sometimes drinking water by itself is not helpful. Drinking water with other foods or water in combination with electrolytes or protein carbohydrates, that will help with the retention and that will help with rehydration. Replenish glycogen. So this is where it comes down to, again, we want to make sure that, you know, what is it that they're preparing for? If they have a game several days in advance, it's easy enough to replenish glycogen within several days. Okay, if they've got a game the next morning or later on that day, it's much difficult, much more difficult. So now we want to be having something immediately following. If glycogen's not adequately replaced before the next game, that means that next game we're going to enter fatigue much more early. Okay, so for carbohydrates, the goal is that we want to choose a lot of the same carbohydrates we talked about earlier in the pregame nutrition. We want to aim for about 1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram. So again, the 50 pound or 50 kilogram athlete needs to be taking in about 60 or 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrates to adequately replace their glycogen. Finally, protein. We want to repair muscle tissue with protein. The goal should be 15 to 30 grams or so of protein, depending on the size of the athlete. Smaller athletes will need 15 to 20. Larger athletes may need closer to 30. We want to do it with complete proteins like dairy, meat, fish, and eggs. And these are some good quality protein sources. Okay, this is another list of proteins. Basically, what I would suggest for you for recovery purposes is that you want to pick out two to three items from this list. Okay, two to three items from this list will be adequate recovery for all of your athletes. Okay, that's going to equate to about 15 to 25 grams of protein or so. Okay, so having two cups of milk, having uh, a cup of Greek or cottage cheese, having a couple of eggs, having two or three ounces of meat, that will adequately replace or repair muscle tissue by giving us enough protein and high quality protein. Okay, so three R's of recovery. So again, just one review of that, one to 1.2 grams per kilogram of carbohydrates. Make sure that we're taking in 20 to 24 ounces of fluid for every pound of fluid lost. 
and we're taking in 15 to 30 grams of protein or two to three options from that previous list. Okay, if they are the type where they do not feel hungry after a game or if they're the type where they don't have a lot of time uh, or they don't have access to food very quickly after exercise, okay, in that sense, then we want to try and do liquid recoveries. These are easy options or these are some snack options as well that they can have on site that are fairly cheap as well. Okay, things like chocolate milk, I know we hear it all the time, but it is a good option. It's helpful for protein, carbohydrates, and rehydration. Smoothies, making either juice or milk with yogurt and frozen fruit is an easy option that they can be having. Kefir is a liquidated form of yogurt that comes in a flavored version that's a good quality, uh, high quality protein. Commercial recovery drinks like Gatorade Recover, Ensure, or Boost are all helpful because they all contain fluids, electrolytes, protein, and carbohydrates. If they want something a little bit more solid but still small in portion, things like yogurt, peanut butter and jelly with a little bit of milk, and string cheese with uh, a sports drink, something like that. Those are all good options of carbohydrates, protein, and fluids. For more solid meals, these are some solid foods. So again, Similar content, these are all going to be about 1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram for most people when it comes to carbohydrates. So 1 to 2 cups of pasta, 3 or 4 ounces of grilled chicken, okay, baked potato with fish, sub sandwich, whole grain bagel. These are all good options that they can potentially utilize as solid food sources. Okay, and then in summary of what we're doing here, um, basically we want to make sure that they are taking in a pre and post game meal, uh, it doesn't need to be complicated, it doesn't need to be expensive. Like I said earlier, we're looking for easily digestible carbohydrates. We want to make sure that they're getting adequate protein and a little bit of fluid beforehand to make sure that they're hydrated. Okay, utilize cheap grains, starchy vegetables, fruits for your carbohydrates. Choose things like dairy, eggs, or poultry as affordable lean protein sources. Try and restrict the fat, fiber, and veggies because they're not doing a whole lot and they do increase your risk for stomach discomfort and try and make sure that you are aware of the amount of time that they have to recover, the access to food that they have for recovery, and things like that. Okay. Lastly, my contact information, you'll have it on the packet. Any questions or anything I can answer for y'all? Any questions for Brett? Uh-huh. Uh, let's say the athletes you know, they had a pre-game meal, no kickoff, and then you have a three-hour regular. Do you have any Okay, so the question being that if a, we have a start a game time start and then we have a rain delay and they're stuck in the rain delay for several hours, in that scenario, um, easy foods that they can have. To me, uh, bread is always an easy thing to have on hand. So white bread, bagels, uh, and jelly and, and honey. Those are things that are easy enough to have on hand that they can be brought to the game. They're not going to be ruined or anything like that. It's a snack that can be consumed. It's light enough. Because what you don't want to do is consume, you don't necessarily know that you're going to have a three-hour rain delay, right? It may turn into three hours. Canned can fruit would be one thing. Uh, canned fruit is a good option. Um, I would say scenarios like um, canned fruit, applesauce is another good option that I would use. I believe applesauce should be sourced you know, shelf stable that they can have. Either of those would be things that I would provide as a snack. To me, if you feel like the the easiest thing to do would be if you feel like there's going to be a, a long downturn or there's potential for rain or something like that, I would prepare for it by ba buying something in advance. As far as long term, having stuff on hand to me, those sorts of items, uh, sports drinks, having those on hand or uh, Sports bars that are a little bit lower in fat content would be things that you could do. Yeah, some of those are higher in protein content. Some of the power bars are a little bit lighter. I would look for the ones that are a little bit lighter in protein, a little bit lighter in fat. If you feel like it's going to be a long rain delay, then they're going to be that should be easy enough for them to tolerate. If you feel like it's a very short rain delay, if it looks like it's going to be 15, 30 minutes or an hour, then I wouldn't worry about doing that. Then it would just be sipping on sports drinks to get them through. That answers your question. I'm 
Uh, other questions? Anything else? Appreciate you all having me out. All right, is this on? Yes, it is. Um, thanks, Brett. Uh, I have the, the uh, privilege of introducing our next guest. Um, he is, uh, along with many of his titles, our medical director at the Memorial Hermann Sugarland uh, Hospital for Sports Medicine Outreach, and um, he's a medical director for the Sugarland Skeeters. Uh, I've had a privilege of knowing him since he was in residency, um, so he's a really good friend of mine. So uh, we're really happy to have Dr. Ray Halbajani out here, and uh, I'll turn it over for him. Um, should be a uh, very quick, light. Uh, lightning fast, hopefully. I know you guys are kind of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, so we, uh, we'll respect that. Yeah, that's pretty well parked, yeah. Let him get set up, and then we'll turn it over to Doc. All right. You, ready? you guys can hear me? Okay. You guys all are awake, right? Tuesday afternoon, second and last speech. All right, so we're going to try to make this as uh, painless as possible. So I've got to talk on uh, updates on sickle cell trait and rhabdomyolysis. I'm going to try to keep this more up for current new theories versus what we already know. So we're gonna try to keep this as simple as fast as possible. I have no financial disclosures to uh, disclose. I don't have anything to discuss as far as money I'm gonna make off this, even though if you guys wanna leave tips, they can leave them on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Rhabdomyolysis. This is the time of year, right? Rhabdomyolysis, everyone gets to see it when football camp starts in about a month from now, and everyone loves this 101 degrees weather we're having with 90% humidity after this nasty rainstorm. We all know this lovely pathway. It's there for you guys. I am not going to discuss this because I wanted to make sure that we understood a couple of key components. One, it's the repetitive exercise that overstretches the sarcoplasmic reticulum, causes a whole cascade of events, and causes muscles to break down in an excessively high rate. As a result, you get the enzyme deficiencies, you get the low potassium, and you get the low oxygen, causes your ATP, which is your powerhouse molecule, to go away and all of a sudden everything starts going down. Increase your muscle breakdown, causes you to clog up your kidneys and hence we're in rhabdo. All right, what causes it? Oh, so this is something I wanna to touch on because from our standpoint sitting as trainers, we have a lot of things that we can see when it causes this, but the only one we actually see is excessive physical exertion. When you guys see rhabdo for the first time, you know, usually it's due to the heat. And my theory is if you see it for the second time, it's not due to the heat. Something else is causing it, and you need to figure out what is triggering it to happen. Muscle injury, obviously, you can have crush injuries. You can have blunt force trauma started off. You can do the exertive physical exertion. Muscle ischemia, decreased blood flow. Occlusion syndromes can also cause this to happen. Temperature changes, we all know about that. We know about the excessive heat in the lovely state of Texas. What we don't know about is the excessive cold, okay? And this is where it gets a little dicey. Excessive cold doesn't have to be below freezing. It has to be a rapid change in temperature, which we love seeing in Texas so much, that can potentially cause an athlete to not be adapted to that temperature change that can cause this to happen. As a result, you can get ischemia and you can get cellular uh, degeneration. Malignant hypothermia and malignant, uh, malignant syndrome, medication-based, right? Medication-based. Certain combinations of medicines cause it. Nowadays, a lot of those medications are not mixed as well as not even be given anymore, but it needs to be aware of. Abnormalities in electrolytes and serum, chronic low potassium. All right, so this is one that I harp on because guess what? We don't draw labs on our football players, do we? But how many of you guys think that these guys go home and eat enough potassium to come back the next day? They don't. They always live low. What is too low? We don't know. What we do know is that it puts you at risk. So if you have football players that are starting to cramp up, that's a risk. Likely means low potassium. It's a risk to go into rhabdo. Um, overuse of diuretics. Not much seen in the high school population. In the college population, you might see it. Now it's a banned substance, but it's there. You have to be aware of it. Infections. So the list of these infections are quite bad. But I want you to focus on the first two, staph and pneumo, early onset pneumonia, skin infections that progress can easily cause you to go into rhabdo. It's there, you need to be aware of it. And obviously you have all your fun toxins, the ones I always stress on, or uh, your lovely ones that are in the schools these days, all these lovely drugs that are legal, as well as the alcohol. Um, 
not as common are the insect bites and the stings, but they are there. As far as uh, steroids, corticosteroids that you know, physicians like myself will give time to time for uh, acute inflammation and arthritis and bursitis can also cause you to go into rhabdo, especially if you exert too hard. Endocrine disorders, we're going to skip over. Genetic and autoimmune disorders, I'm going to touch on for a split second because a lot of times, once you have that second or third episode of rhabdo on a particular athlete, that might end up being the cause, and it's usually missed until the genetic workup is complete. Okay, NCAA Sports Medicine Handbook this year changed their list of top 10 factors to increase risk. A lot of these are pretty straightforward. A lot of these are, um, are the common sense, but I'm going to repeat them anyways. Athletes who try their hardest means that they try harder than they're supposed to try. They come in there and say, you know what? This is day one. We're in camp. I'm going to go and push myself without having worked out the week before and do everything I can to make the team without having any kind of warm-up. Guess what? That person's at risk. Workers are not part of a periodic, periodized program in the sense that, okay, once again, kid comes in, summer he's been laying off for four weeks, all of a sudden he decides, I'm going to just push myself and work out, work out, work out, go to a uh, SAC camp over the summer and push himself harder than he ever has and not warmed up to it, he's at risk. Novel workouts, meaning that they do something that they've never done before. And they go in there with 100% effort and they're going to go crush that workout instead of learning the technique and learning the workouts. And then they go see, right after that, they go rest. So they put their body into hope overdrive and then they rest. Guess what? Call it puts you at risk. Irrational, intense workouts intended to punish the athletes. We know our coaches. We know coaches sometimes like to push kids hard, especially if they're trying to beat something into them. Guess what? It's now a risk factor in NCAA and they're going to they're gonna attack this if they see it. Performing exercise to muscle failure, meaning doing squats until they, they can't do squats anymore. Yeah, how many times have you seen that? Decide, you know what, we're just going to let you guys go until you can't go anymore, no matter what you feel. But you're at risk. Focusing one muscle group, that's a big one. That's not one we deal with much more now because of the fact that we've gotten much better at our workout regimens. But if you do it, it causes a problem. Increasing number of sets and reps means that you are going to, say, do 15 reps, and now next day you can do 20 reps in the exact same time you did those 15 reps the day before. Puts you at risk. Mind the weight without looking at fatigue. Puts you at risk. Kind of makes sense. I'm, not, I'm saying the same stuff over and over again, but it's to a different degree. Okay, we know what it looks like. You come in, patient comes in, the athlete comes in, they have localized muscle pain, they feel weak, they are slightly swollen, they're not, they're, they are swollen, they, feel, they may have some bruising, and they might feel some tenderness, right? You can also have the T-colored urine. T-colored urine is myoglobin. It looks like blood, but it's not blood in the urine. That's what T-colored urine means. You can get to that point where you get fleas, no, uh, fever, nausea, emesis, confusion, yada, 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 but you should catch it before it gets there. That's the key to the puzzle. Okay. How do you diagnose it? That's how we come in. Physicians come in, we check the labs. Labs show that they have increased muscle enzymes. They may have been spilling uh, urine myoglobin. They might be having increased potassium, increased kidney function. Uh, enzymes, I mean, kidney enzymes cause decreased kidney function. Okay. I will tell you right now, less than 10% of rhabdomyolysis ends up going to kidney failure right now. And the reason that's the case is we catch it early. And that's the point. We need to catch it early before it gets into the kidneys. If it gets into the kidneys once, that second episode is going to cause more damage. So it's not, it's, not, it's not reversible damage in a sense. All this fun stuff that's all in there, that's for what we do as workup. The key is once they're in, they get put in the hospital, they get fluids, and they get everything checked out. They get checked out, they get checked out, they get checked out, and they get flushed out, and then they go back in when they're ready to go back in. How much fluid do we put into these guys? Anyone ever seen a kid with rhabdo in the hospital? Yeah? How much fluids were these guys getting in? Do you remember, by any chance, a day? Yeah. Okay, so your body has six liters of fluid, right? These guys are going wide open. These, might get, these guys might end up getting up to 10 liters of fluids a day to flush their muscle in, muscles out as well as keep their kidneys intact. These guys will get 10 liters of fluid a day. Guess how many times they're going to urinate? Maybe once. 
because they are completely uh, spacing all the fluids into the interstitial space because of the muscles that are broken down. That's what's the point. Second thing, you put all that fluids in them and you don't put potassium in them, guess what? Potassium drops even more and now we have life-threatening cardiac issues that we have to worry about. You alternate these fluids. You consider mannitol, don't use it anymore. Usually we can get away with just giving the fluids and you can end up going to dialysis for this. I've not seen it. I've read about it. I hope I never see it because that means that whatever we did, we did wrong and it doesn't matter who says otherwise. How do you prevent it? Follow the rules. Follow the rules. The follow the rules as far as moderation, working as a team. You know, Brett spoke a few minutes ago about nutrition. I think that's extremely important. Working with your coaches to figure out where these guys' reps max are and where their maximum thresholds for all the different exercises are. And that way, you can uh, make sure that you don't get this kid to a deep end. Make sure you have an EAP plan because remember, sickle cell and heat stroke can also cause this. And that's what I'm going to transition into. Sickle cell trait. Okay. NCAA over the last five years has changed the guidelines twice now. Twice. And they're going to continue to change it because we still don't know how to handle this properly. 2009, 2009, 2009. This is when it first started. And I say it three times because until that point, everything was hunky-dory. You have to have an exam, laboratory exam, saying that this kid has been tested for sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait. doesn't matter if they say yes or no. You have to be tested. They can decline it, and they can sign a, re a written release. If anyone's ever seen that written release, it's extensively long, has two to three pages long, basically says that if anything happens to you as a result of unknown sickle cell trait, all parties are not liable. It's a long, kids usually will sign it, but they don't know what they're signing into. History, Division I took it on 2010, and now in last year, 2014, Division Three. so all three divisions of NCAA have now adopted this policy. Here's the funny thing. The American Society of Hematology, which is the big society that deals with sickle cell, opposes this. Do you know why? Anyone know why they oppose this? It was on CNN about a year ago. Did anybody, anyone ever listening to it? They basically said that you are discriminating against kids that have sickle cell trait. It is not a hindrance to athletic performance. And this is from the American Society of Hematology. It says that we're that you're going to harm them because you're going to identify them and then you're going to uh, reduce their workouts and reduce everything as a result when you don't necessarily have to. Proper hydration and proper workout techniques can make them as good as an athlete without sickle cell trait. So guess what? The biggest governing body that deals with sickle cell said no. NCAA said yes. Here are the organizations that actually said yes. A whole bunch of them. So it's, it's still a conflicted argument. The point I'm trying to make is that it's going to change again, but I need to get you guys updated as far as what we need to see. Is it effective? This is where we get into statistics. And as physicians, as healthcare providers, we need to know if this is cost effective and does it save lives. You've had one death a year since 2010 before, it ha before the law came into place that was due to sickle cell trait. Since then, we've had one known death and we still don't know if it's truly due to sickle cell trait. So did it reduce? Possibly. What has it done for us? It has allowed us to educate, 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 and train not just the patient, but all of you guys, all the coaches and the university staff to let them know that we have to be aware of these kids. It also has given extra attention to hydration. So once again, do we know that we did, any, did the sickle cell screening itself reduce the number of deaths, or was everything else we did as a result of it reduce the number of deaths? Here's the effect, cost effectiveness. This came from Kim Harmon's group in the University of Washington in Seattle, who's a primary care sports doctor who's presented at last year's annual sports medicine meeting. All right. How does those numbers look for you guys? Expensive, aren't they? Right? The simple sickle cell test in an African-American for, for screening cost effectiveness costs five hundred dollars per athlete five hundred dollars okay look at all athletes ten thousand dollars and that's the easiest screening test with the lowest yield the hemoglobin electrophoresis which is the one that actually will give the actual diagnosis is nearly triple this is how much money we spent how much money we have spent screening sickle cell in four years without any startup cost. 
it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for, say, for in five years, going from one death a year, going to less than one death in five years, not knowing if everything else we implemented as a result caused uh, the reduction in deaths. Okay, so here's the concerns. Here's the concerns that the American Society of Hematology came up with. One, they're concerned that we might limit the athlete with sickle cell trait. Two, they'll be discriminated against. Of course, there are HIPAA laws, right? HIPAA laws mandate that if a patient's information does not need to be made public and the patient chooses not to make it public, they have right to not to make it public. This screen test says otherwise. Because the myth is diagnosed as sickle cell, guess what? By NCAA policy that the people that need to know will need to know. It violates the HIPAA law in some legal schools, and this is actually being challenged as we speak in the courts. Do we have enough support, counseling, from a genetic standpoint to go in there? We don't. I can tell you that if I have a positive sickle cell trait athlete in, in a college setting room, I'm going to end up getting the hematologist on board because I can't provide enough counseling, and so are you guys. So, and do we have, I mean, we're blessed in the city of Houston to be able to do that on the spot. Some of the smaller towns, they can't. So what's the harm? The harm is, you know, universal precautions, but they're not practical. All the stuff that we do for coaches, you know, tell them to go push hard, play hard, and we are now telling them they can't do it, you're basically discriminating. Okay, sudden death. This is the one thing you're worried about in sickle cell trait. This came from an article by Dr. Luce Moore in 2012, basically going through the pathway of how sudden death occurs. Basically, you get low volume, you start getting this early uh, sickling, and it causes changes in your blood oxygen as well as lactic acidosis, increases temperature, dehydrates the red blood cells, and bam, everything starts going to a vicious cycle. Once the cycle starts, it's next to impossible to start, which is stop, which is why sickle cell disease athletes don't participate. Sickle cell trait, we just give them oxygen, we let them rest, and we give them hydration and try to reverse the cycle. How do you treat it? It's all about diagnosis. It's all about the diagnosis. Once you make it, you call it, you say it's heat illness, is what it normally presents it as. You get them, they cramp. Okay, so this is the key differences. They cramp. They're not weak. They don't spasm. They're not hot. They're less than 103 degrees usually Fahrenheit when they sickle cell. They're conscious. They don't black out like heat exhaustion or seizures. They stay awake. They follow the ground under their own control. They do not just collapse suddenly. It doesn't happen. These guys are in complete control. It's gradual. It's not sudden. It's not rampant. And it's not extreme as well as temperatures and vitals. That's the key we need to be aware of. If it's unconscious, something else is also going on. Usually rhabdo, sudden cardiac arrest, or heat stroke. It may not be just a sickle cell trait uh, issue that we're dealing with. Biggest thing for you guys, you see it, get them out, call EMS, get them out of there as fast as you can. It's simple as that. There's no reason for us to manage this on the sidelines at all. There's no, nothing, even as a physician, and a pro saying that we can do except for give them oxygen and put, in a, uh, put an IV in that will help them reverse this. They need to be monitored much more closely. You see it, you send it. It's as simple as that. This kind of a come together slide, this has basic you know, recognition and early treatment stuff for a struggling athlete. You know, the differences between sodium depletion versus heat illness versus sickle cell, and these are just kind of laid out. This is actually from the same uh, paper as Dr. Harmon wrote last year, so I'll pull this diagram out for you guys so you have it to review. It's really easy to mix these three up. It's even easier to treat these three once you know how to recognize it. For the unconscious athlete, you don't have a pulse, you know what to do. You have a pulse and you worry about, you got sickle cell, you worry about rhabdo and you start doing the rhabdo protocol. If the temperature is up, you put them in the heat stroke protocol. Simple, easy stuff. You just need to know the key differences between the three. That's it. I made it easy on you guys. I try to keep it under 20 minutes. Kush, you guys are dead. Questions you guys have at all? Or you guys' brains are dead and you don't want to talk anymore? Anybody got questions for him, for Doc, before he leaves? I know, you can't let me off the hook. Brad says you can't let me off the hook. Can you get us free skaters tickets? Right here. So if you have an athlete that is um, at sickle cell trait but at risk of being, you know, 
and you are traveling with your sports team to high altitude. Yeah. Do you yeah. So that's a good question. The question was, if you have a positive sickle cell trait athlete, and you're in a setting where you're going to have to travel to a high altitude, and we'll use Mile High Denver just as, a, as an example, what's going to happen when they hit Denver? All right, so we know what's going to happen. He's going to become relatively hypoxic when he, as soon as he gets there, right? He's going to have a hard time adjust, getting his body to adjust to the thinner air. He's going to have no problem with his fluids, but he is. As a result of the decreased oxygen, he's going to be relatively dehydrated the minute he gets there. You're going to tell me, let's just put them on oxygen. I'm going to say, no, don't put them on oxygen. You're trying to get them acclimated to the environment. You're going to tell me, just we're going to hold off for a few days and let them play later. That's what I would do. I would give, you know, the normal athlete takes 72 hours. He needs more time. He needs five days. We had an athlete when I was in fellowship that had this exact same problem. We had to fly him out when we had to go altitudes greater than 4,000 feet. We had to fly him out two days before the rest of the team so that he had two extra days to get used to the environment and get used to the oxygen changes and get used to the fluid shifts before he could go out and play. It is hard to do from a resource standpoint, and that's where it becomes sports to sports specific. Non-exertional sports, golf, for example, not as hard. Football, extremely hard. Soccer, basketball, extremely hard. Tennis, not as bad, actually. But it's there. You have to, as a, as a sports medicine trainer, as an athletic trainer, in your guys' standpoint, you're going to have to make those decisions. The decisions for you guys are going to be based on how bad this kid is. If this is a well-controlled kid, you trust them, you might fly him out 24 hours early. I would probably try at least fly him out a day early to give him a chance to acclimate. That's me. I, don't, I, I like playing it safe. And that's what we did when I was in fellowship. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? What was, I remember making a statement. When you get that third rhabdo, what was the thing you look for? All right, what do I look for? Genetics. So kids that have carnitine phosph uh, phosphatase CPT deficiency live, quote unquote, lived in asymptomatic rhabdo. So question now becomes, A, this kid was held out for six weeks. Should he have been held out for six weeks? That's the first question. The second question is, did his enzymes actually go down? Or did he just get hospitalized and when they were trending down, they let him go and as soon as he got home, what did he do and what was his baseline? I will bet you my bottom dog, kids like that, he's probably got genetic deficiency. He probably needs to be worked up even further. You're the trainer. So you're going to say he has asymptomatic rhabdo, right? So what's his risk? Anyone know? Kid that has elevated enzymes but has no symptoms, what's his risk? Yeah, okay, let me ask the bigger question. Show of hands, you have that kid. Would you let him participate in contact sports and exertion of sports? No. There you go. So what would you do? What did you do? I'm curious. Yeah, he didn't come back to us either. What, what, what happened? What's, see? It needs to be worked up. Even at rest, having an enzyme level of at least 500 above tells you something is going on. Creatinine kinase is a muscle enzyme. It's non-specific. It could come from the heart. It can come from the muscles. So it has to, we have to figure out where it's coming from and why it's happening. And no, that's why that list is so extensive. That's why when kids get admitted the first time, I end up doing the whole panel trying to figure out which one it is. And I will urine test, I will drug test them too. Because I've had a couple of kids in Rabdo, they came back positive for drugs that they should not have had in the system. Yeah. Cocaine. Yeah. It's wonderful. Other questions you guys have? Yeah. So any cramp a sickle cell trait person has is not your typical cramp. And I leave it at that. It means that if they cramp up, you're not going to just hydrate them, stretch them out, and put them back out there. Their cramp is not coming from depletion of electrolytes. Their cramp is coming because they're hypoxic. They're, and so it changes. 
you can put them back in after waiting a little while, giving enough chance to get the oxygen levels back up and making sure they feel completely symptom free. Most people don't. It, and they don't. And it's as simple as that. When we have a sickle cell trait person and I know about it, they get cramped up. If I don't feel comfortable and I don't know the kid well up, I'm not putting him back in until I know where his baseline thresholds are. At. And we'll test them. We'll put him on the VO2 study, we'll shred him, we'll test them, we'll figure out where he cramps up and make a decision at that point. From your guys' standpoint, stop. Yeah. Do you use a go? Is it EMS worthy? It depends on the rest of his vitals. So if he's completely stable and he's cramping, and you just say, shut him down, put him in a cool environment, give him a chance to breathe, hydrate him, and he's fine later that day, you're fine. But if he starts doing more than that, or he's cramping in more than one site, or he's starting to cramp up where he's you know, not doing being himself, that's a do not pass go. It's the, it's the vital signs, it's the person, it's where, and how quickly did it happen, and how aggressive is it becoming. Any other questions? Yeah. No. And I and I ask this because if you take and, and I my situation I've, I've been in, we've had a lot of professional athletes that climb to Denver, play football games yeah. while at Denver, not ever have a problem. Correct. There's no aggravation process at all. There's some that can't play in Denver. Right. They 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 can because every time they go out there they have major issues with the sickle cell treatment. Right. So my question I guess is you find a benign student who has sickle cell trait, but has never had an issue, everything he's done in your program has never stood out in any way. Do you worry about it as much? You worry about him or not as much. Well, I know. You, yeah. You, no, I don't worry about him. job to keep an eye on him, but my question is, do you have to take every precaution? Do you, you see something that makes you nervous about this So I use the old model for athletic trainers, right? Be overprepared, don't be underprepared. So, okay, I'll answer your question with the statement. I did how many physicals for you guys? 2,000, 2,500? I can tell you, I know I saw six sickle cell trait positives. I know which questions I asked all six of those sickle cell traits. All of them were fine, perfect scenario. All I did was let the trainer know you have a sickle cell trait person. Doesn't look like they have any symptoms. Looks like we're good. They've done it for years, no problems. You just need to be aware of it. That's it. Because in that case, when they get their episode, usually if it's not in a different environment like Denver, it's going to be very mild. Because you're going to have to push them really hard to get that little bit of symptom from it. So that's statistics and that's anecdotal from my standpoint. Do you have to be prepared for the worst case scenario? You should be. Do you need to make special preparations for the worst case scenario on a kid like that? Probably not. You just need to be aware of it. And that's what I would do. I would be aware of it. I'd have my trainers be aware of it. I'd make sure we have an oxygen tank, maybe a D oxygen tank, and just keep an eye on them. Now, if it's a kid, if it's an athlete like yours, where you come in and say, I've known this kid guy for three, two or three years. They're junior now in high school. They're fine. No problems. Obviously, at this point, you're going to treat them like anyone else. You're not going to worry about it, but you're just going to be aware of it. It's better to know than not to know. That's my answer. Any other questions? All right, Leslie, you're up. Thank you, Dr. Bajani. I'm here to introduce our next speaker. It's the moment you've all been waiting for your whole lives. He's been a, he served on the board of G-Hats for many years. He's been a athletic trainer in the high schools for many years before finally coming and serving for us from Memorial Hermann Ironman. It's the man, the myth, the legend, Mike Vara. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to ask that you limit your applause to five minutes, please. Number one, uh, thank you to Bob Marley for putting this thing together. It's uh, really a special event to be here, to see all of you guys here. I know you uh, had a good, fulfilling school year, uh, physical therapist. I know you don't ever get a break, but you don't work as hard as we do. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I'm just, I'm just, that's, that's with just a kind comment. Um, Bob had given me a, a laser pointer, but it needs Cialis to work, so 
we're not going to worry about that. I'd like you to take a, just a quick glance on my first slide, please. Uh, I worked long and hard on it. Uh, the lighter side of athletic training, you know, you guys are here, you know, we bang you with all kinds of serious topics and, you know, you, we, we all do the same job, you know, of course I do it a little better than you, but that's okay. Um, but it, it is a difficult job, very stressful. And so you get here and I see some of you, you come out and you sneak out and you get some coffee, something to drink and, you know, you've got the glazed look and, you know, here's Dr. Bajani asking us stuff, questions and of course, I don't know the answer, but you're all embarrassed because he asked you the question, and you're like, well, that's not what my talk's about. My talk is about the lighter side of what we do, and, and this can pertain to any career. Uh, it just so happens to be that uh, I happen to be an athletic trainer, and I love it. I love what I do. I really do. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I could have done anything else. Uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in San Antonio, and there's five military installations there, and uh, I would lay in the yard and look up and see all these planes flying off. I, well, I wouldn't mind being a pilot. That seems like it's pretty cool. I'd go to the air shows, you know, and you sit in the cockpit and everybody's butt's been there. It's all wet and sweaty and everything else. But anyway, besides the point. Uh, but I thought, you know, I could, be a, I could be a pilot and get up and do that kind of thing. But evidently they want you to be smart to be a pilot. So I said, no, we won't do that. But um, <clears throat> my sophomore year, the spring of my sophomore year at Southwest Texas, I needed a three-hour elective on Tuesday and Thursdays, so I go to registration, and there's this bitter, old woman, bitter. And I said, "Excuse me, ma'am, I need a you know elective." And she grabs the paper out of my hand, and she goes to the computer cards, which shows all the story is, and she pulls this thing up, and she doesn't say thank you or go to hell or nothing. She doesn't say anything. So I go through the labyrinth and I pay and I, you know, and it says care and management of athletic injuries. Well, I was going to be the world's greatest football and baseball coach. That was my, you know, I couldn't be a pilot, so I'm going to be a football and baseball coach. And um, so I pay and I show up at the class and there's Dr. Bobby Patton, who's about this tall, and he talks like this. And I'm walking in the, into the uh, classroom and he says, where are you going? I said, well, sir, I'm going in here. He says, no, you're not. I thought, wow, this is, it's been a great collegiate career so far, you know, so. And uh, so I explained to him the situation. I needed the class, and I thought it was the class that the coaches took. And he said, no, it isn't, and oh, hey, whatever. So for four weeks, I sat in the back of the room. He said, sit in the back room, don't say a word. And I said, yes, sir. So I'm just sitting there, and you know, everybody's all chummy, you know, and they're all up front. And they're talking about, you know, their push of bras and all the things they talk about. And <clears throat> so after the fourth week, he said, you know, come sit over here with us. So I sit down there and we're doing all these, you know, projects and papers. And, you know, you know, it is when, you, when you're in a click, you talk about the things that you click with. And I'm on like, you know, hey, how about the Beatles, you know? And so, um, so the, the semester ends, and it's May of my sophomore year, and the semester ends, and Dr. Patton's passing out these pamphlets. And it's, uh, you know, it's a horrible, horrible pamphlet. I don't know if you remember the old NET logo is a, a fat cross, and uh, anyways, horrible. So, but the thing that caught my attention when he says, in this career, you know, you, you can move up. It, there's opportunities. I figure what positive crap he said, you know, and all that. <clears throat> well, I thought as a coach, you had to start in junior high and work your way up. I didn't realize you could start anywhere. So I followed him in his office and said, Dr. Patton, how do I become an athletic trainer? And he rolls his eyes and I'm like, look, dude, I just want to know how to do this. So he said, well, you have to, you know, do so many hours and blah, blah, blah. And you have to serve a three-year internship. And I thought, damn, three years. That means I got to be a, a senior twice again. So <clears throat> I, you got it. Good for y'all. <laughs> so I said, yes, sir, if you don't mind, I'll do it. So, and I, there's a point to the story here, trust me. So <clears throat> the summer goes by, I go home and act like the good son and all that. And I get a letter from Southwest Texas and I'm like, yeah. And I open the letter and it says, dear Mike Ibarra. I'm like, hmm, you know, your time to register is such and such because we register when the athletes did. So I'm, hey, great. So I go in there and I go through registration and I 
breeze right through it, get all the classes I need. I get right in there and, you know, it's great. And uh, my first, not even hour, my first 30 minutes of being part of the sports medicine team, Dr. Patton says, come here. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm, 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 you know, I walk in there and he goes, who in the hell do you think you are? I said, sir, he goes, why did you use Mike's registration? You know, you're not supposed to register. This is just your first year in the program. I said, sir, well, they sent me a letter, but they misspelled my last name. He said, well, it's not for you. Our manager is Mike Ibarra. Okay, so here I am, the lighter side of athletic training. <laughs> <clears throat> See, I want you to feel sorry for me, because when we go to this thing, you'll say, man, that's a hell of a guy. Uh, but I, I put down here how to better enjoy my career and live longer. Whether you live longer or not, that's your own business. But in enjoy your career, I, I, I am blessed with Mamal Herman, uh, and before that with Rich and Bone and Joint Clinic, and before that the Roger Clements Institute, that I get to go out and basically see my friends. So when I call in a school or go out and do an injury clinic, you know, it's great. No more lugging coolers and, you know, but that's what got me to thinking about this. I mean, a lot of us, I'm hoping you'll laugh through most of it, but you'll see things that we do in common. You think, you know what? Yeah, that's happened to me. I do that and it does too. Uh, obviously, I see all these real people that give these real talks and they have these disclaimers. So I'm, I did one too, so, <clears throat> you know, I don't know anybody for anything or, I mean, my mortgage, I guess, but uh, how many of you, and I want to see hands, how many of you are pet parents? What the hell is a pet parent? What is that? <laughs> huh? What is that? A pet parent. I have a daughter. I mean, uh, that's the best I can do, but uh, I love this picture. Cat's like, dog, I'm done, so. There you are. But that's, you see, the cat's been pretty busy. And I'm a cat. I've got a cat and a dog. Uh, the dog doesn't really care that I'm here giving a speech, but I ran it through by the cat, and she, she just didn't approve. So, there you go. Uh, nothing, nothing ACL, I promise you. I, I just, I, I guarantee it. Uh, concussion management, uh, man, it's got to end someday. I, I don't know if they're going to outlaw football or what, but good God. But that's coming. Uh, and then uh, nothing surgical because I wasn't sure how to spell it, so I put it down there. Uh, but it, this is a picture of Dr. Michael Kent and Dr. Bedgood and, and the mascot for HBU. Uh, I've got a story. It's not a pleasant one. It's another one you're going to say, oh, man, that poor guy. Um, they're playing. We play this game at um, BBVCD Compass Stadium. <laughs> and... Uh, before before this game, the HBU game, they had a soccer match on the pitch with somebody, and so we get in there, and there's kind of, it's, it's really kind of an East Ham if you've ever been in there, but the mascot's walking around, and it's about, I don't know, about 110 degrees, humid, and, and the, it's walking this way, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, I didn't support the she was going through a heat, so I'm, you know, what do I know? I'm just, I'm just me. Um, no Jerry Springer on me, please. How many of you get to see Jerry Springer? I know you work, but surely you know who the guy is and what his, his uh, program's about. First of all, I don't know where they get those people. Uh, you know, it's somebody that's done something to somebody. They've had a kid or she's had a kid or somebody's had a kid and I'm going to prove it with DNA or whatever. But uh, Jerry Springer, I wish he was here to talk to us. That's who we need in one of our talks. We have two chairs up here and we'll pull a couple of you out here <clears throat> and we'll have you fist to cuff and something, I guarantee it. This is a picture, of, uh, we had a party at my house, a Christmas party millions of years ago. And this gentleman here, was a, he's our head basketball coach. Well, he hurt his finger and he kept asking me, hey, you got a minute? How many of you had that happen to you? Someone knows you're an athletic trainer. Hey, could I ask you? You're like, oh. And then, and then you say, well, I think it's this. Well, are you sure? Well, first of all, I don't care. But <laughs> <laughs> and then you lie and you say, yes, yeah, I care. And it, we think it's this and whatever. But I told him, I said, man, you got a mallet finger. You got to keep it, you know, like we were taught yesterday. Is you got to keep, oh, Casey told us. 
you got to keep it up and by he, he kept it in the splint for about four minutes so he wanted to know why it was like that and my answer was I took a picture and there he is so there you are uh, let's talk about your career uh, this is the Weimar Wildcats that's my password on my login um, <laughs> You know, you're, I'm sorry, so many stories. You know, Mamal Herman is a great, it's a great, I'm trying to find my boss. It's a great <laughs> play. I want, I love Mamal Herman, it's great. But every four days, we gotta change our password. It seems like it is. And I'm like, God dang. So all I wanna do is change like, make it plural or something, you know? But you can't do it because I guess IT is a real thing in, in the hospital system. But uh, I make a, I call on Weimer. Uh, every Tuesday and for me it's just an adventure it's an adventure in a bottle uh, I get there and it is all right who needs to see the trainer and I've told him hundred times coach it's athletic trainer okay who needs to see the trainer <laughs> and we go out there they're wonderful uh, the, the gentleman on the right um, Bob gave me that uh, pointer that doesn't work uh, right here uh, He's a wonderful guy. He's the women's coordinator. He's a head basketball coach, a head softball coach. Uh, I've had the pleasure to go to the playoffs with them. Uh, they were back-to-back -back state champs in softball. And it just, it's just a pleasant experience. And the kids are great. But they're the kids. They play everything. You know, they go from cross country to volleyball to basketball to softball, track. They do everything. So you, see, you keep seeing the same kids over and over. So when I turn in my monthly report on injury checks, I just wonder if people think, well, this guy's lying because he keeps putting the same people down, but it's, yeah, there you are, so. Uh, you look forward to the new day. When you get out of bed, when you crawl out of bed and you put your 12 toes on that floor, do you think, man, it, it is wonderful. I'm, I just can't wait to get to school. I just can't work, wait to get to the clinic. Or, is that you? No, I didn't think it was, okay. <laughs> What gets you through the day? Great picture. I asked uh, some friends of mine to, to send me pictures of the kids. Uh, this is from Katie Sports Medicine, Katie High School Sports Medicine. Look at the young lady. Look, look at her. Look at that face. Sweet, angelic face. And look at this guy. What's he doing? She's like, dude, you want some water? You know, and that's, you got to laugh. You got to laugh. How many, how many times on game day, and if you're not in the clinic, this might be a hard thing if you do, but on game day, you're trying to focus just on a few things. You're trying to narrow down your list to about 200 things to try to remember before the game. And then you bring cubs and you have kids. That's your job is to have water for the. And here's this idiot turning around. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Justin and Russell, but I'd have to beat this kid right here. <laughs> Look at her. She's like, I hope she's spitting his water. I really do. So. That, 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 that would have got me through the day. I'd have just big loogie. Here we go, baby. Uh, some days, nothing happens like you want it to. And, and the gentleman on the left, well, you play soccer, so that's what you get. Um, <laughs> so there you are. There you are. <clears throat> um, I'd like to say you have chosen this career. You weren't forced into it like I was. Um, I'd like to think that you know you came up through life from the embryonic stage. You gave you were, you cracked the hatch and you were born, and here you are. Uh, that you chose to be an athletic trainer, but these are the things we have up here. And uh, again, according to Kale, I don't want to read it to you because you're not stupid. Uh, <laughs> but that's not the way he said it. Kale's in it. <laughs> Kale, I love you, brother. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> anyway, back to Kill. Uh, athletes in the drama. Good God, is it is it a day to day thing with what's going on with the kids? You know, when I first started, it was you know I need another jock, and I asked, well, who would you do with your first one? You know, and I'm like now it's you know look, I'm on Pin Post or Tweety or whatever you know and. You know, I, I'm not going to go to a D1 school. I'm like, mm, okay, well, you know, be a Marine. Hell, I don't care, you know. <laughs> uh, parents and their emotions. When I was at Seven Lakes, um, I'd come, I'd get to school about 6.30, and I'd, there's, a, there's two doors. There's actually a main door in the train room and then a door over here in the office. It's kind of through a storage room. 
and I would turn the corner and there'd be a couple of parents, you know, with their Schlumberze tags and, you know, they've got their coffee and they're all dressed, you know, 10 times better than you are. And they've got their little, you know, little Nathan and Ethan and, you know, whoever. And, you know, he's got a little injury. Could you look? And I'm like, God dang it. And I said, <laughs> I said, okay, injury check starts at 645. So I'd open the door and I'd sit on my chair and I'm thinking, you know, I should have just slapped that old lady that gave me this class and just, you know. <laughs> so you turn on the lights, but you don't turn them on only because the parents would look through the glass like. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, go to work. <clears throat> you know, and then again, they ask you, well, well are you sure? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, your, your kid's hurt, I'm sure of that. Um, Coaches, I love coaches. Um, some of my best friends are coaches. <laughs> Man, them jokers. Uh, males and female, great. Uh, you know, everybody's very passionate. They want to win. Hell, I want to win. Uh, you know how it is. Your season, your your life just goes better if you're winning. You know, winning solves a lot of problems. So, so you have that relationship with the coaches staff. But you know, bless their heart. They're hired to win. You know, we're hired to take care of the kids. And in a roundabout, bastardized kind of way, we're all pushing for the same thing. But coaches, bless your heart. Nowadays, when I first started, it was, hey, you know, let's just kind of get through it. And, you know, let's, let's play 10 games with the off week. And now that's zero week and, you know, seven on seven and year round. And there's a lot of pressure on people. They got basketball camps year round, you know, all kinds of things. So bless her heart. That's why I said fill in the blank. You know, those ladies and gentlemen, they go through quite a bit. But uh, like I said, some of the best friends I've ever made have been coaches. Stress, yes. Yes, that's all I'm going to say, yes. You, you, you damn right, there's stress in what we do. Um, a skill for quick decision making. Uh, Jimmy Davidson was recently inducted into the Greater Houston Athletic Training Society Hall of Honor. And when he was making his speech, he mentioned how when he runs out to an injury that he asks God to go with him because he doesn't know what, what's going to happen when he get there. And, you know, he's right. And you've got to get there, and you've got about 5.1 seconds to, to make some kind of discrimination before somebody says, hey, what's wrong with him? You're like, mm, I don't know. I've only had 5.2 seconds to look at him, so I don't know. <clears throat> uh, and I love, I love the officials that come up. You take as much time as you need. Well, hell, thank you. I, you know, appreciate a dog, you know. God. Uh, man, I just, again, so many stories. I know, I know you're in a hurry to get out of here, but um, bless their hearts. Long hours on duty. Uh, you know, that's changing, and that's, that's good. Uh, when I first started, I thought, man, they want me here at what time? And I'm going home at what time? I thought, well, okay, well, you know. That's, that's the nature of the beast. Uh, our career provides us with friendships. I mentioned before some of the best friends I've made outside athletic training have been coaches. Um, and every time I lived to campus, I always thought, well, I'm leaving a little piece of myself. And I thought, hey, you, you know, we'll see you at a game or something or when we kick your ass in the playoffs or something like that. Or personal satisfaction, I mentioned it before, I really like what I do. You know, we get to see a kid return back to play. You know, off they go, they get back. Uh, but one of the biggest things I've always enjoyed is when you see them as freshmen and they're like this big and then they're seniors and they're like this big and you're thinking, damn, I remember when you couldn't tie your shoes and now here you are starting kind of thing. Uh, excitement, I love it. I've been an athlete my whole life. I mean, we, we used to play tackle football in the street, which is stupid. Um, <laughs> I look back on it now, it's stupid. It was stupid then, it still is now, but uh, back then, it was so much fun. You slam somebody in a car or in the curb, and you're like, hoo, hoo. So there you are. Uh, employment, uh, that was interesting. Um, when I was sitting in that class in the back, and Dr. Patton would talk about, well, you know, he could be at a high school, uh, a, a college, university. You know, back then, we didn't have all these other options you have now, you know, the ballet, rodeo, uh, military you know, offshore oil, you know, we didn't have all those things, but he said, you can get a job almost anywhere. I'm thinking, that's pretty cool. So I was born and raised in San Antonio and thought, well, I'll go see the world. So I ended up working back in San Antonio. So there you are. 
memories, very pleasant memories. Uh, these two young ladies right here, this young lady right here, uh, these are both student athletic trainers at Brazos High School. I have a contract with Brazos High School for athletic training services. Uh, this young lady right here was a valedictorian, and this young lady was the salutatorian. Is that correct? The, the second. And I was used to tease her, think, oh, you're number two, <laughs> whatever. Um, but they're great. She's going she's to go to school to be a cardiac uh, care nurse, and she's going to be an athletic trainer. So wonderful. This young man here, he's a football player at Brazos. Uh, he graduated two years ago. He's at UT now. He throws the hammer. Uh, I said, I did too, you know, <laughs> but I thought he was like in construction or something. So <laughs> stupid me. I'm so sorry. Uh, these right here, these are the students I had when I was at Hightower High School. This one, we're not sure. We think he's on somebody's wanted list. Um, <laughs> this one here, she's an anesthesiologist. Uh, she's also a captain in the Army. Uh, Gwendolyn. Uh, went to Texas State. She went on to Clemson as a graduate assistant. She got a job at University of Arkansas, and now she's at Florida State. Um, this young lady here, I don't know. But this gentleman here, he was, uh, when we went to the, she had student athletic training workshop, I think it was at um, the Woodlands that year, I think. This is where we were, maybe, I don't, I'm sorry, they all run together. But Gwen won the, uh, Exemplary Student Athletic Trainer Award, and George back here, he got second in the taping, and I'm proud to say that we, we cheated our butts off to get him that. <laughs> I showed him how to cheat, and it worked. Um, our career, it's not always a walking out, it is. Um, you know, every day is not the most pleasant, but Jesus Christ, you know, sometimes I walk into somebody's office, and they're just, they're just swamped. You know, they give you that look like, you know, take me out of here, you know, and I guess I think I'm Caligon or something, you know, save me or something. But, you know, Debbie Downer, Negative Nick, you walk in and say, how's it going? Oh, I hate this place. I hate these kids. Whoa. Hang on there. I'm getting ready to leave, so just hang on. <laughs> and, you know, and I feel for them. I understand it. You know, I was, I was in high school for 20 years. I understand it. I get it. The day's long. It's hot. You get chafed. I get it. Okay. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I get home at 4 o'clock, and I get to watch Jeopardy. No, I get home later than that. I get home, <laughs> I get home at 7 and watch the news. There you are. Uh, what factors drive you? Get it. There's a car. Get it. What factors? Uh, is it the money? Because we know we do it <laughs> for the money. I'm sorry. Uh, prestige? So you're a trainer? I never forget my uncle. He says, so you're a trainer. What do you train? Man, I just like, Uncle John, shut up. Um, <laughs> comfort, you know, what, what do you find comfortable at your position? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I just felt comfortable doing it. From the time I started, I thought, you know, this is pretty cool. And I, I think I've been blessed. I know a lot of you that have been in a while, and, and some of you may have just started, and you're kind of trying to find your way too, but I love it. I really do it. The kids, man, they make me laugh. The parents are idiots. I'm sorry. Um, it, to me, I, it's, I'm very comfortable what I do. Uh, security, I mean, you're, you're secure in what you do. You know, you get there, you're there three, four, five years. They appreciate what you do. They hang on to you. They've got your back. The administrators love you. You know, you get good marks or I forget what they, evaluations, I'm sorry, I forget what they call it. Pressure, you know, there are some people that thrive under pressure. Uh, I'm not really one of those, you know, I, it's nice to, I think pressure keeps you on your toes, but I don't like what it does to your health and to your house, to your home life. I mean, some of that, it's like a police officer. I've got a, two friends in San Antonio that are police officers. Uh, one's actually still on the streets and you talk to him and it's, man, it, he frightens me when he talks, you know, cause well, you know, we did this or this guy came at me with a knife and this and not that, damn. So I said, so what do you do? And he says, oh, because he loves it. I said, okay. Uh, how about your athletes, your student athletic trainers? Do they, do they uh, you know, fight, drive you? I want to tell you a story about this car here. It is a 2014 uh, Ford Mustang Cobra GT, if I said that right. Uh, Dr. Kent, uh, who was my team physician when I was at uh, Seven Lakes, he's an RBJC UT physician. 
he took his truck in to get it serviced, to get the oil changed, and he ended up driving out with this. And I'm like, wow. I drive out with a free brochure is what I, what I get. <laughs> uh, what do your kids say about you and your program? Do they ever make comments to you one way or the other? You know, I, one of the things that always made me feel best was when a kid would say thank you, or a coach would say thank you, or a parent would say thank you. Administer, somebody says thank you. I thought, oh, you're welcome. Or, you know, hey, uh, I'm sorry to bother you, but, you know, thanks for seeing that kid or, you know, whatever. Now it's a, a nice email or whatever the case, you know. But what do they say to you? Maybe because I would get on them. I'd, I'd rip them a new one if they tore up the kids. If they said anything to my student athletic trainers, you know, you're dead. You're, you, you're nothing to us. We had a stereo in the training room, and the kids would come in. They'd log in, and then they'd go sit down, and we'd do whatever we do with them. We had a freshman football player come in, and I kept my stereo on sunny 99.1. And he came in, he looked, and he changed it to some redneck station. I left my dog and beat my dog or something. And I, I just kind of looked like that. And the kids, he got so quiet, you could have heard a bee fart in there. <laughs> and they all looked at him, and the kids said, what are you doing? And he's all buck tooth. Uh, you know, I just, I didn't want to, I want it. And the kid said, you better change it back. And the kids are ripping him better than I would have done. I thought, <laughs> all I wanted to say, hey, Bucky, put the music back. So, <laughs> but, uh, so there you are, old Bucky. You know, and this is true. I, I, they'll tell you some of the dumbest things, some of the funniest things. That, that's why I miss being around the kids on a daily basis because, man, they just, some of the stupid, that, why didn't you tell me about your injury? And they look at you like, you know, uh, so what did the doctors say? And I love the one, was it fractured? No, but he said it was broken. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> so how long is it broken for? I'm like, oh. what's, what's their answer when you ask them that? What do they say? What, what's their answer? Yeah. I don't know. Where's your note? I don't know. How long are you out? See previous statement. Okay. Uh, I do want to share this photo with you. Uh, this, this is one of our linebackers when I was at High Tower. Wonderful kid. Daniel, I can't remember his last name. Daniel, first name. Wonderful kid. You know, we got to have him. He can't be out. He's got to go. The world's going to end. Gravity will stop if he doesn't play. Well, he's got a, a he had a pretty substantial abrasion from the turf, so I've got a glove on, but I don't have one over here. The reason I don't have it is because it tore when I put it on. And I want to hurry and be the savior of everything, so I didn't get another glove. So I'm wearing one glove and over here. And the young lady over here, you can't really see her, <clears throat> but she kept saying, where's your glove? Where's your glove? Where's your glove? And we're sweating and it's hot and they're yelling at me, we need this kid back and, you know, hurry up and you're stupid and blah, blah, blah. And she's over here, where's your glove? Where's your glove? And I'm like, Anyway, we submitted this picture for some kind of brochure for a swatter or something, and they sent it back because I was only wearing one glove, I thought. <laughs> and I, I wanted to say, you're lucky I was wearing pants. But we just, <laughs> uh, Coaches, again, I don't mean to, to get on the coaches, but, but how many of you, read this, and how many of this has happened to you? Hmm? Uh, next weekend. It's next weekend. That's the weekend when you promised your spouse Girlfriend, boyfriend, we're going to the beach, baby. It's We're going. No, you're not. I love the picture. I was at a golf tournament waiting on all these drunk bastard uh, golfers coming around. and I love it. <clears throat> okay. And more information that you get from, from whoever. That was rained out yesterday, which was Thursday. It's scheduled for tomorrow, which is what day? Yeah, because we don't do a damn thing on Saturdays. Great news. We found a game for a freshman football team for this evening. Yep. So now we got to go round up those 14 kids. Just got word. Eight more teams coming. Yep. Track meet. How long does a track meet last? Too long, yes. <clears throat>
Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you go to the ice machine, you lift it up, and you think, okay, we're going to have tea tonight. <laughs> I, I, I heard this twice in my career. Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing right now? So I went out and officiated a baseball game. JV baseball, golly. Okay, these are, these are answers you can give to coaches, parents, or whoever. And when you read these answers, I want you to read it like you know how it's supposed to be read, okay? And when I show you the first one, you'll get it. So some classic answers you give to people when they give you those, those things. You know where that's from? Jaws. You know that when uh, Roy Schneider filmed that in the movie, he made it up right then and there and left it in the movie. Trivia for you, I've got it. Okay. <laughs> that was my favorite line. They would tell me bad news, and I'd go, I'll be back, and I'd take off. And <laughs> but I don't want to be a pirate. <laughs> yeah, you tell your head coach that. I don't want to be the one. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> Wait. Order now and we'll send you another piece of crap for free. Just pay shipper. How can you, how does that even make sense? I'm not getting it free. I've got to pay. Why can't you put it in the same damn box? You know? <laughs> Say, that's, I love this one. They got that old lady. What kind of, this ain't a Buick. I'd say, you're damn right. It's not. <laughs> Let's get jiggy with it. I didn't realize this was a song. My daughter told me it was a song that was famous. I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. I don't know. Is that true? Anybody? Yeah, so I'll let me. I think it was a Will Smith song. Uh, you don't care. I get it. Okay. <laughs> you look marvelous. Yep, that was another favorite I had. Okay. Participate, attend school activities such as a band concert. Do you even know where the band hall is? Do you, do you go to these things? You ever been to a Christmas concert? It's pretty cool. Those kids work pretty hard. You ought to go. They see you there and think, hmm, wow, look at here. Uh, National Honor Society, uh, graduation, if it's not required, do you go? You know, you've had these kids for four years. Maybe now it's time to, to see them off. You know, maybe you've cared enough for them to take care of them for four years. So now, hey, what's one more day? Uh, fundraising items for non-athletes, Jesus Christ. FFA. Mr. Barrow, do you want to buy a ham? They don't sell hams at HEB. And then you pay $28 and it's this big. I'm like, damn. I guess I could have ordered one and just paid for shipping and handling, I guess. <laughs> Attend faculty functions. Well, if your principal has a Christmas party, you better go. That, I don't care if you don't know anybody there, you got to go. Booster club meetings. Uh, I would always join the booster club. That way I was the voting member. So when we vote on the stuff that I wanted, I could make sure we try to get it. Uh, prom and homecoming, ha beautiful, 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 and she's not bad either, so. <laughs> uh, career day activities, uh, I, I hope you, you push your career. Uh, again, you got to kind of love what you do. I realize not every day is perfect, but career day comes around, so yeah, I'd be more than happy to help out. Uh, remember, do you, how many are able to, maybe you don't do anything in Ford, but you have little celebrations either in the coach's office or with your kids. The custodians, uh, I loved all the custodians I had. Uh, they were great. They'd been over backwards for us. Uh, at one school, when I was at Woolridge, they actually washed our clothes. And they'd fold them up and put them in the bag. And I said, you don't have to fold them. Just put She said, no, here. And I always thought, so we always took care of them. They, they were wonderful to us, and I think they deserve the same. Wear pink, uh, October. Those kids bring in rolls of pink tape and want you to tape them with them, and everything's pink, pink uh, mouthpieces and towels and spats, and okay. I said, okay, I, I get it. I'm, I'm all for it. Save the tatas. I get it. Support your students. A uh, young lady here from Deer Park, uh, she, she was one of three uh, uh, recipients this year. Uh, I love this one. Okay. How has our career evolved then? I'm saying then when I started, and I've been in 35 years, so I don't know if there's too many others in here. 
Some of you have been in athletic trainers for like 12 minutes, so we'll see how it works. Uh, back then, the switchboard closed at 4, which was great because then my wife couldn't call and say, when are you coming home? The phone, she just, it just wouldn't ring. Uh, now you got cell phones, you got texting, and you have the interweb. Um, texting is a wonderful thing. Anyway, uh, VHS cassettes, cassette tapes. I see some of you, I see some of your lips moving out there. Uh, streaming, I don't know what that is. I just wrote it in there. <laughs> Knee-high socks, man, I loved them. I, I thought we were bad. They came just right below your knees, and you wore those uh, bike coaching shorts <laughs> that were here, and they, were, they rode up to here. And for some of us, it looked like you were smuggling cantaloupes, you know, and stuff. And, <laughs> you notice I said some of us. Now we got footies. Uh, salt tablets, Jesus, man, when I got out, God, when I got out, you could see the trail to the field where they, it, it was wonderful. Now, uh, I'm like, and when I played in high school, we had to, the coach stood there with a paddle and until we took those, I was like, you know, there's got to be something illegal about this whole setup, so, but now you have Gatorade and and what is it, the, the G series and the performance and, yeah, okay, just drink water. Uh, polyester, there we go, the bike shorts. It was great, polyester, we had game pants when I first started and you're running out and you can hear the fire start in the back from all the, <laughs> man, it was, it was great. And then uh, once they stunk, that was it. They, they stunk forever. Now you have dry fit where it, Shows your man breasts and all this. I'm like, I'm like, God, how is that better? I mean, they gave me, I wear a medium shirt, and they gave me a medium thing. It looked like, a, it looked like I had a tube top or something. I was, <laughs> uh, 80 to 90 hour work week. I mean, that was, that's what you did. That's what you did. But you people now, you work 20 hours a week. I've got to be here till four. I'm like, wow. Yes, you work on Saturdays. Water hose, man, that's how you did it. <clears throat> I'd get up there, I had a kid assigned to run the water so it wouldn't be hot. And we'd stand there in the mud and just everybody, it was great. I mean, it was great. Now you have Water Boy and the stuff that Robbie had out here. And oh, here's it's sanitation and oh, whatever. <laughs> Writing a letter? How many of you have written a letter in the last five years? Anybody? Yeah, okay, that's what email's for. And remember, <laughs> email is considered legal in the courts. So, surgical scars. Yeah, I don't know how many people say, you know, I got this, you know, I got hit, and you know, I tore my knee up, and I got a scar and everything. Now, we have tattoos. And I've asked some of you here in this meeting, say, do you have a tattoo? And they're all like, well, well why? I don't know, I just thought I'd ask. Hell, I didn't know it was a secret. And then we had football, now we have football. So there you are. <laughs> now, uh, who is it? Uh, Jeff? Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember. You might be a redneck. Well, you might be an athletic trainer if you post schedules on the fridge instead of your kids' stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, baby, I got a game this weekend. Oh, okay. You keep passwords on a sticky note by your monitor. <laughs> this is considered a bad thing in Mamal Herman. So. <laughs> I, nothing to say, nothing. You're, you're laughing, so y'all are all going to burn in you know where. But you get home, shower, and you put it back on. Why? Why? Why do you, why? Tell me, one of you, one of you sinners, tell me, why do you put it back on? Because mm -hmm. you open up that drawer, and it's a special drawer because it has all your white practice t-shirts mm -hmm. yep yeah buddy next one's even better you sleep in your school gear mm -hmm. baby here come the thundering herd mm -hmm. oh no, no no scores tonight yeah. 
God. <laughs> that, that's why my marriage was so successful. <laughs> no, I can't, I can't tell you that, so never mind. I'm like, oh. You bring home towels to wash your freaking car. <laughs> What's wrong with your towels? Oh, uh, they'll wash them at school. This is a great one. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, when are you sexually active? <laughs> Do the math. Merry Christmas. This is a great one here. Yep. Uh -huh. Honey, can you bring home something? We need a kid's table. I got a baby. It's in the truck. <laughs> yep, you give your spouse matching Oakley glasses. Wow. Folks, this is not a lie. This actually, not to me, this actually happened. I thought, man, how is that a gift? Man, she looks cool in them. Did she ever wear them? Well, no, but that's besides the point. You drive to school to buy ice? You work 20 freaking miles from your campus, or you live 20 miles, and you're going to drive past how many HEBs and Randalls to go get free ice? Mm -hmm, there you are. And this is even better. <laughs> hey, where's, where's the Miller Light? Well, it's right there in the St. Luke's kid, you know. Yeah, buddy. The Fighting Brahmas are, have the uh, Schlitz in there. This one, I'm going to get you on this one. <laughs> lights, please, Kale, lights. Where are you? Where are you with your game shirt? How many are wearing your game shirt right now? Raise your hand. How many of you have your game shirt on? Yeah, I, I do. I, and then you wear khakis. They need to outlaw khakis. Please, God, please. How many of you here have less than five years experience? Five years experience. That means... You've got a chance. We think you're going to make it. Hang in there. Helps on the way, sort of. Remember, Mamal Hermit Sports Medicine, breakthroughs every day. How many here have more than 20 years' experience? Yep. Yeah. I would. Yeah. You know, now it kind of gets, I don't want to say nothing in our careers routine. And I'm, I'm talking for all careers in here. Nothing's routine. No things do change from day to day. But for the most part, you do a lot of the same stuff. You know, a lot of the same names come up and just put a different face and a different idiot in the helmet. And it's all. But have you ever imagined what you might have done instead of going into athletic training or physical therapy or whatever else? Did you, can you imagine doing yourself, doing something else? You know, I told you about being a pilot and, you know, I forget what else I was going to be. My dad was a post office employee. My mom worked at home. I didn't want to do either one of those. But I... I, I Really couldn't think anything else I'd want to do. I never would have met Mr. Gunn. Uh, if you ever had the opportunity to meet Bobby Gunn, wonderful old war horse. Uh, his, when he would shake your hand, he would say, he'd bend his finger in some kind of weird way. And, it, ooh, man, it was kind of like, oh, Bobby. You know, and he'd shake hands and he'd stick his finger in your hand. It's an old war wound, is what he said. And uh, I would have never had the opportunity to meet him. Uh, our gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen like him who, who've been icons in the profession, had I not done it, I don't know, I don't, maybe I would have met a world-famous pilot or something, but uh, Mr. Gunn, he was a wonderful man. Uh, got to share many a, a meal with him, loved Chinese food. Um, I hope they have takeout in heaven so he can, uh, he can enjoy it. It was a great, great thing. So thinking about what you might have done instead of being an athletic trainer is, is something to think about on your way home as you're trying to go through traffic. I just I like training. These are some tips for you. They're not written in stone. They're just things that I think about. Take your breath before you answer. Before you answer that parent, that coach, that kid, just don't, don't just bark out an answer because you can't unring the bell and, and then you've upset somebody and, and they don't get to see you in a positive light. Uh, eat breakfast at home. I can remember driving to school, coffee, donuts, and you're trying to do it and then you get back and there's, you know, it looks like a continent of Africa staying in your pants and stuff and <laughs> You know, I just so at least eat one meal at, at home instead of your desk. Um, wear comfortable shoes. Anybody know what SAS shoes are? Anybody? Yeah, there's something wrong with you if you do. Okay. I <clears throat> uh, got to laugh a lot. You have to. If you don't laugh, you're going to cry. 
uh, delegate jobs, man, let that kid make the ice bag. Let that kid take the cooler off the gator. Let them do it. Don't just, here, I'll do it. The kids aren't stupid. They know, I don't know how to do this. Or you do it better. Yes. Kids are not dumb. Let, let someone else do it. Be a mentor, please. Uh, the reason I asked about if you were here less than five years or more than 20, that group in the middle, you know, they, they've kind of found their way. It's the young folks that, that need the help, and it's the older people that need, we need to keep them from putting the gun up there. Um, call them, text them. That's the right word, right? Text. Uh, stream them, something, you know. Uh, but help somebody. Help somebody out. Let, let's, let's, let's keep our, keep our sanity. You remember your family and friends, very important, very, very important. You know, call them on their birthday, you know, uh, leave school early or take the freaking day off when it's your spouse's birthday or something like that. Do remember those folks. Got to act the same at all times. This was one of our big rules. After a football game, anything that we covered, whether we won or lost, I told the kids, we do the same thing. We all go across the field, shake hands, and whoever wants to shake hands, we come back, we dump coolers, pull up the table, pack everything, go inside. Let every, we did it the same way. You know, if you win, you don't, hey, man, we kicked your butt. Or if you lose, you're like, oh, you're crying. I, I can't stand that. Let's do it all the same, and let's go. And, you know, hey, that way people enjoy kicking your butt less. So I, I, I can't put that in a sports medicine way, you know, or, or say it in Latin or something. Keep a positive state of mind, yes, always when you can. I know you're tired. I know you're fatigued. I know your butt hurts. I know you're, you're tired. You smell. You just But try to be positive. Uh, be the person everybody wants to know. You know, you don't have to be the person everybody loves or likes, but, you know, when, they, when you're walking up, do they go, oh, damn. No. They roll their eyes. Like, I'm, I'm thinking, is there something in your eyes? Something bothering you? you know, so. Okay, I prepared a little slideshow for you. So, you know, when you wipe your eye, if you're crying at the end of it, you're a sissy dog. All right? <laughs> I'm 
I can't top that, but uh, our vestibular training and, and concussion uh, stuff is next. So we will, if you want to take just a second to stretch, walk out, get a drink, do whatever, come back by, let's be back in about five minutes though, so we can kind of keep on, on scale here. So.
This will be the start of our evidence-based practice for ATCs, for PTs, LATs. This is still part of your 15.5 hours. So if you're, if you're, if you're, what? You just saying A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay. So LATs, PTs, PTAs, yes, you get 15.5. This is part of that. For athletic trainers that are certified in EBPs, this is part of your 2.0 hours of your evidence-based practice category. You get 13.5 of category A hours, all right? Kale, are you ready? All right, we're ready. Chris Shields is going to talk about a vestibular training. He's a physical therapist with uh, a lot of experience uh, with this. And this is going to be the new hot button, I think, is the vestibular training part of it. And then we'll talk about return to play, theories, practice, studies. So, Mr. Shields. Hello. There we go. Hi, guys. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you letting me come and speak. So I'm a PT and I do physical therapy uh, at Ironman in the medical center. And one of my specialties is vestibular rehab and concussions. So I'm just going to go through a brief overview of concussion, which I'm sure you all probably have seen before. And then I'll go into some of the vestibular rehab components. Um, feel free to ask questions if you have any, okay? I don't know that Colin and I can follow uh, the light show and music, but... We'll do our best. We'll do our best. All right, here we go. So we'll just go over some concussion basics.